everybody, and welcome back. Digital Marketing Wednesday with uh, my buddy, Coach Ben Mathis. He's here to drop some knowledge on us today. As you might have already seen in the, the prep for this and the comments for this, we got some great topics for you today. We're going to cover uh, digital resources for reaching out and connecting more with people, uh, virtual hangouts and building culture through those. We're going to do some gaps and talk about what's going to stick around on the other side of this thing and how we can be continuing to plug some gaps. Uh, video content uh, creation and talk a little bit about curating content as well. And uh, then we'll see how much time we have left on the back end. Also, so you know, as you're preparing for next week's session, we're going to get deeper in the weeds on uh, the video content piece and, and the direction that Ben and, and his team see it going from there. Uh, so Ben, what's the latest in Raleigh, my friend? Uh, we had a tornado yesterday or day before. I don't, the days all blur together now. Other than that, beautiful weather, uh, uh -huh. getting back into springtime. So all good in Raleigh right now. Yeah, yeah. I think we had some locusts to come with our weather as well. So uh, <laughs> we're, we're still working, <laughs> working our way through that. Uh, so, right, right. Uh, so you and I were talking and preparing for this. A common question that's coming up a lot right now is additional ways to use digital to connect with and to reach out to people. So I'd love for you to get us started today on that, please, sir. Absolutely. It's, a, it's an interesting topic to me because I'm always curious about how can we expand databases? How can you expand people that are, or people that you want to talk to maybe? You know, how can we do that, especially when you're quarantined, right? Or you're at home and you're, you can't go out and physically reach people. So what are we doing to use technology to connect with people? And what you can scribble in your notes is key relationships. So this is where this came up. Uh, stealing from the one thing, one of the seven circles is key relationships. So that really got me to think about how can I do this uh, digitally and, and where can I take it going forward? So one of the things I thought about was uh, I kind of made a wish list of all the people that I wished I could talk to. Didn't matter. I didn't put any restraints on who it was, how famous they were. Maybe they're motivational speakers. Maybe they're business people. Maybe they're in real estate. Maybe they're in a different vertical that I'm interested in. The thought process was, I'm going to reach out to these people who probably before were so busy running around to different speaking engagements. Maybe they were on panels at conferences. Maybe they had their own things they were doing and they were teaching. Most likely, they're going to be at home or their, you know, their, their schedules have slimmed down somewhat. So the likelihood of them looking at different pieces of messages from random people might be a little bit higher. So it's kind of a moonshot to start out, right? So that's where I started with saying, who are the people that I would love to go talk to if I could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation? Side note there, if you're going to go this route, make sure you have some good questions for them. They appreciate good questions, off-the-wall questions. Uh, don't make it a waste of their time. Always try to bring value to them as well. So starting with that thought process, uh, I, I spread it out from there and said, okay, so say we don't get in touch with those people. Right. We can't we can't get those people on a phone or on a on a on a message somewhere, whatever platform you're using. What would the next step be? Well, for me, it would be looking at their circles. Who is at their company? Who is someone else that they're talking to or that, that, that has influence on them in some manner? And I'm going to go talk to that person and not just as a connector for me to get to the next person. It's more so because I'm interested, one, in learning more about that person because they're probably very well connected as well. They probably know a lot of people that I could add to my world, different things of that nature. So I'm going to go there, talk to them, and most likely they're behind the scenes, so they're not as out in the public view, so they're not getting as many messages as the main person may be getting. So that's kind of that backdoor entry you can take on that. Um, and the way I always think about this is a connector. So if we take this away from the looking for the big person you want to go talk to, go back to your database for a second and just think about that. I know some of the comments we've been hearing are, I feel like I've hit up my database a lot. And whenever I think about that, whenever we have new agents on a team, we're, we're always telling them to race to get to at least 350 people in your database, right? That's just an arbitrary number that works for our team. It could be different for yours. And what we're trying to get them to do is add people to the database. And the question always comes up, how do we do that? Using digital right now, one way we're doing it is talking to our database and asking them the question, who do you know that we should know? And not, a, not just in the real estate context, right? This is not just saying, who do you know that wants to buy, sell, or invest in real estate? It's who do you know that I should know? And here's one of my favorite things that I like to do is being the connector, being the connector or the matchmaker with 
in our database. So if you if you coach with us, you've heard this before. We talk about taking your top 100 and being a matchmaker in there for people looking to buy or sell, things of that nature. Uh, I like doing this uh, in general. So to give an example, when you go to a networking event, some agents love networking events. Some agents don't love networking events. It seems a waste of time. To me, it's all about the intentionality behind that event. So when you go in, do you have a plan of who you're going to talk to, uh, uh, who you want to connect with, what information you want to gather from them? And what I always tell people when I'm talking with them about the, if you're going to take on networking is, if you're doing this business to business conversation or you're talking to your database and there are business owners in there, they're typically looking for two things. And they may not say this to you outright, but typically they're looking for two things. The first thing that they're looking for is they're looking for more business, right? They're looking for either referrals from you, referrals from your database, or looking for ways to generate business ideas or different business partners you can connect them with, but they're looking for more business. That's typically one thing. The second thing I found them to be looking for was uh, talent. So people, they have gaps in their people world. So it was always, do you need a salesperson? Do you need an admin person? Do you need a CPA? Do you need someone to help with your financial documents? What do you need that I can provide? And in my networking, then I would file that away, go back to my database and say, who can I plug in to help with these gaps? Who in here needs to know this person? What I started doing was building a pipeline of people to connect to other people. So if we take that back right now and you're talking to your database or digitally speaking, whoever you're having a conversation with, bring value to that conversation and be thinking about who can I connect them with? What value can I bring them? Who what, who in this world, in my world, needs to know each other? So going back to the social media channels, if you're using Facebook, by the way, Facebook is a really good one to connect with people on. And my other favorite one right now is LinkedIn. The most underutilized one that you can really get good conversations on, especially if they're in that more famous world role or maybe they're higher up in a company, is Twitter because they use that more for business talk now or short form business talk. So if you want to connect with someone, that's another good place. So those are my top three I use right now. Um, but going back to that, you can really dig in there and bring value to those people and asking them, you know, who do you need to know in my world or who can I connect you with? And when you start doing that, even if say you start with a database of 100 people, they say the average person knows 150 people. Some of us have thousands of Facebook friends. In reality, it's about 150 close connections is what a typical person can keep as connections for themselves. So when we look at that number, um, if every person just gives you one more person to talk to, you've just doubled the size of your database, right? And even if it's not for you to talk to, again, about real estate, it's for you to connect with someone else, right? Maybe you find someone who is looking for a job and you're looking, you have someone who wants to hire somebody for a specific job. Maybe it's you're helping someone who's in a jam, you're helping them by introducing them uh, to someone in your database that can help. For example, we've had situations where people are going through a divorce and they need to talk to a divorce attorney. So we would connect them with one of our people in that role. So different things like that. Some, some one of our people had a financial issue going on around taxes. So we connected them with our CPA. It's always something you can do to connect people that you trust in your network. So keeping that mentality, the question you can always ask is, who do you know that I need to know? And right now, the best way to frame that question is, um, local business owners. Who who do you who who does your database know that you don't know about that would be good for you to connect with and then broadcast out to the rest of your database. Um, so think of it along those lines. The second way you can use technology right now to connect with people, um, thinking back to key relationships, we were really thinking along the lines of my vendor list. So who are my key partners that I utilize in every transaction? Now we have really good partners, the ones that we work with. My my challenge that I saw was the list wasn't long enough, so I didn't have depth in my bench. And when I started really going down the list, I started noticing there are some gaps here for particular services that we could be providing for people. So um, if I knew people I wanted to connect with, again, I would use the, the, the technology right now to go out and connect with people, start the conversation with them and start there. And then if I had a gap, let's just say, for example, landscaping was one that we need. We needed some people for landscaping. The way I would approach this is I would go to Google, right? The almighty Google, type in top landscapers in Raleigh. Now, when you hit that search, what happens? 
at the top of it, you have all the millions of all these search results, but at the very top, you have that paid advertising section. This is where you reach out to people at and you, you start a conversation with them. And the reason we do this is because we know they're spending money on marketing. They're trying to grow their business. So they're more likely to be receptive to a conversation from someone about how can we code brand together? How can I get in front of your database? How can I put you in front of my database? How can we work together on this and grow each other's businesses? So this is something that I always look for is when I'm just doing a simple search on something, go into Google, find the person that is uh, advertising or, or spending money on pay-per-click, start a conversation, and you'll never know what value they may be looking for. So typically, again, it goes back to those two things. They're looking for more business or they're looking for talent for their business. One of the two. So looking at how how can we fill those gaps and help them out be the connector in there and then also if you can help them with anything they're doing so at this point if you've if you've taken the digital marketing course with us or um, you've been in real estate long enough you probably have a database so you have some chops around how to build a database and you'll be you'll be surprised how many small business owners don't have that put together so if you can help them with that on the other side they may be willing to put your content in front of their people and it, uh, it builds some good synergy well, you make a, a lot of great points in there, Ben. One of the things that you touched on right there at the end, and I'm really glad you did, because the question comes up looking at ways for us to connect and add value to the people in our sphere of influence. Uh, everyone who's watching this has a unique skill set, a unique set of talents, and maybe that steps into a void that someone in your database or one of your vendor partners has. So the, the question that is an iteration of what you're talking about that I really like to ask uh, of a, a colleague is what's the biggest challenge you're having right now and let them talk or list what those challenges are and then you're thinking about either ways that you with your unique set of skills can help them plug those gaps or the connections that you know can help plug those gaps and it could be everything from they're having difficulty growing carrots in their garden to they're having difficulty figuring out how to add more people into their business funnel or anything in between and you get to go be the connector. Uh, so what I love about what you're going through there, Ben, is, is you're talking about building relationships with people outside. And, and one of the things we discussed in preparation for this is the, the continuous building of culture inside organizations and how in this world, when we're not getting to see each other in person, we're not getting to hug on each other, or hang out and, 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 uh, and chat it up uh, person to person, how do you go about fostering culture in your organization digitally? Yeah, it's a great question right now that we're, we're getting a lot of questions around is, is continuing the culture that you've probably built inside of an office. And if you're so used to being in an office and rubbing shoulders with people and having conversations and being able to turn around your desk and saying, hey, what do you think about this? How do you keep that ongoing or how do you continue to team build? And, and one of the things we're seeing with a lot of teams right now is they're they're falling into this i wouldn't say trap it's more of a just a, a false sense of this is all we need to do and that's where they just have team meetings on zoom so every time you do a zoom call it's a meeting of some type right and this really hit home with me when i was listening to uh patrick lencioni's podcast this week uh, at the table and one of the things he mentioned was how can you how can you thrive in a virtual environment and i gave some tips and one of the things there were two things that i really really liked uh, the first one was how to do a kind of a team building event. So outside of your normal team meeting where you're discussing like key performance indicators and you're really digging into uh, um, numbers for the team and activities or projects for the quarter, whatever it is, um, you're having a separate time where you're really trying to work on team building. And, and the suggestion they gave, and I really liked it, and we're, we're putting this on our calendar, is to go and listen to his little speech. It's like a 15-minute speech he gives, and I think it's available either on their website or on YouTube, around his book called The Ideal Team Player. And he breaks down what the ideal team player is, what the different personality styles, behavioral styles of that. And then he suggests that after you listen to that, go back for the next 45 minutes and talk with your team about it and say, where do you see yourself at in those three categories? Where are you excelling and where are you struggling? And then let's have an open and authentic conversation within the team about that. Let's have that conversation about it. so it, it takes it away from it being just a numbers or goal-oriented conversation. You're still building that team authenticity. And Patrick Lencioni is big on, on vulnerability-based trust within a team. It's one of his core tenets. So that's a, this really lends itself to that. The other thing he suggested doing 
and I really like this idea as well. Um, it goes back to thinking about office hours. So back in the day when, when I was in college, I remember we had, um, with all of our professors, they were required to have office hours where students could either sign up for times or just walk into the office and ask them questions. And there are times in our day right now where we're, we're, we're if you're not doing a specific activity like lead generation or you're on a phone call or anything like that, um, he suggested that send out a link on a Zoom call like this to whoever's on your team. And if you're not on a team, maybe it's your brokerage, your market center, wherever you're at, um, to a group of people and to say, hey, I'm just going to be on this webcam for a while. I'm going to be working. I have these things I'm working on. If you want to talk while we're there, you have questions, we can mastermind, whatever it is, come and hang out for a little bit. And just have a conversation. And even if you don't talk at all, you can put yourself on mute. You can just have that human interaction that you're not getting um, when you're kind of isolated and on your own. So just just continuing to do those type of, types of things. Those are the two main ones that he had for the um, for the virtual team building that I really enjoyed. And and going forward, I think that's something that even if you're you're not uh, doing that at a high level in terms of when you're back in the office, I think that this is something that could stick. So something Bill and I talked about before was a little bit about what could stick beyond all of this. And I think that this is one of those things that could stick in that while it's always great to have the in-person communication, in-person huddles, in-person team meetings down the road, I think that this could be something that could be really ideal for people who maybe can't make it to certain events, or maybe you have office working hours. If you have, um, I know with, with the parents and all the stuff they have going on right now. So having those time frames to be able to hang out with their team members and build a cohesive unit, uh, that's another good thing that I think we'll, we'll continue to utilize, at least on our team down the road. Yeah, yeah. I love where you're going with all that. And for those of you who run um, uh, medium or large size teams, or those of you who run brokerage firms, one of the things to consider is that in, in any mixture of people, you're gonna have some people who are naturally super, super sociable who are feeling completely deprived from a, a relationship standpoint right now. And they are beautiful and perfect to just the way they are. And then you have other people who are like, actually, this is kind of cool. Like, I don't even really want to talk to people anyway. And everything in between. And, and so part of that is how do you set up your organization to speak to each of the different behavioral styles? And, and just as a reminder for all of us who lead teams is that it's not just about the point of view of the leader. Uh, it's about the point of view of all of the different team members and how you're orchestrating that thing for your business. Uh, and that's going to be different for each of you. I'm really excited, by the way, this is a tad of a spoiler alert. Uh, those of you who are clients and, and team members of our clients, we have a really, really, really exciting thing coming for you guys in that thread in a couple of weeks. I can't tell you any more about it yet. I'll just say it's right in that thread of what Ben is talking about, of building culture in a virtual, fun uh, authentic way. So we're super excited about that. So uh, Ben, you kind of gave us a, a, a bit of a segue into the gaps conversation. Last week, you and I were talking about doing gap analysis on uh, things that uh, that we, that the businesses that we're connected to, the people that we're connected to say, God, I wish I would have plugged that gap sooner. So let's build on that a little bit this week, maybe just with a, a quick snippet in case they missed last week's session. Uh, your view on the, the gaps analysis piece. And then let's talk about the things that you think are going to stick around on the other side of this, because part of it's about plugging the gaps and then part of it's about making sure we're focused on plugging the right gaps. And I know everyone would benefit from your wisdom on that, please. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, ga gaps are definitely a big piece of what we're looking at right now. And, and I think it's a fantastic uh, mental exercise. If you haven't done it yet, that you should do this. We, we asked that we mentioned this on last week's uh, Digital Wednesday was thinking about, you know, before all this happened, knowing what you know now, what are some things that you wish you had in place or, are, or had already been tackling or had already done? What are those things? Um, and those are your gaps. And then the thought process is, well, let's go ahead and start working on those now, because most likely, you know, say this ever happens again, again, we're of the mindset in our coaching company that, you know, if we mess up on something and we get beat one time, that's okay, we'll take that. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a lot to beat us on that twice. So making sure that we're future-proofing our companies right now, or future-proofing our businesses, no matter what comes down the road. And the exercise that it put us through was, can we operate in any business environment? Um, and, and basically, like, if you're not able to travel around or you have to work virtually, can you do that? So that was, that was the gaps that really came out for us. We talked last week a lot about, 
you know, looking externally and internally in your business and identifying areas of where you can either improve processes or maybe add processes, or maybe you're just going from analog to digital. So you're just at the front end of doing all of this, whatever it is, can you operate in any business? And then if you're already operating in that, in that manner on a digital or virtual um, platform, how can you improve it? What can you do to plus that experience, not just internally, but externally as well? So I think people get caught in one of the two worlds where they're saying, what am I doing internally for my business versus what am I doing externally? Or they'll say, I'm just going to focus externally on the client. And then they don't focus internally on their processes without realizing that it does have an effect on your clients or will affect the other, uh, other end of your business. So really paying attention to those areas and thinking about how can you do them better. Um, and for us, going back to it was we've been virtual for like five years, right? So we're, again, again, I go back to you, and this is complete humble here. We're not bragging about it. It's just something we've done for a long time. That being said, there were a lot of gaps that is exposed in our business. And there are a lot of things that I sat there going, I wish we had done this not even having done it, maybe I wish we had done it at a higher level. I wish we had taken more of this on or gone deeper in this. And one of the main areas, and this is my main thing that I believe is going to stick to the other side of this on so many levels is video. I, I am full, I am full on board with video at this point. Um, and it's one of those things where we had started tinkering with this last year and we really got we're getting better at it, doing different things, getting more sophisticated in our processes and how we produced videos and um, how we use them. And then this whole this whole pandemic hit where it was it turned into now video is kind of like the lifeblood of the business. And Again, I think people are waiting for it to go back to the normal way of doing business. And for me, we've shifted into this new world of one, it's become normalized, right? Video is normalized. Zoom calls are something that you'll hear, you'll hear grandparents say when before they wouldn't pick their phones up, but now it's their lifeline to see their grandchildren, right? If they can't get out of the house, it's, it's normalized in business in that we're hearing about closing attorneys using Zoom or doing online notaries, all this different advancements in the technology, and most of it's centered around video. Um, and for me, it came back to really three or, uh, 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 three or four key areas in our business when I thought about video. It's like, how is this going to stick go, going forward? Um, the first is your marketing, right? This kind of is like the no does statement, and it's one of those that it's kind of snuck up and bit a lot of people in the butt. They weren't super prepared for it. They didn't do a ton of video going out of the gate. Maybe you resisted it because you didn't like how you looked on video or didn't like how you sounded on video, whatever it was, but you resisted getting really deep into producing video content at any level, not just in terms of marketing your listing. So um, one of the thoughts that one of the, the questions that we started asking as this has progressed, and really this is where we're future pacing the business now at this point, is how far can we take the buyer down the buying path without them ever having to meet us in person? Not saying that we're not going to try and meet our people, uh, you know, in person and shake hands and all that good stuff. But we want to go out there and kiss some babies, all that we do want to do. My thought process is now that they're becoming, it, it was already normal for them to start their intercept, internet search online, right? Searching for homes online well in advance of ever reaching out to an agent. People will browse and just look at homes online eight to 10 weeks prior to, to engaging us, according to NAR statistics. So from that point now to the actual home buyer search piece, how far can I take them down that funnel where no matter where they land at, no matter if they're on Zillow, if they're on Redfin, if they're on any of the major uh, listing syndicated websites, how far can I get them down the Mathis Real Estate Group funnel so that they want to talk to me about the property because I have captured them either with a 3D tour, with a video tour, with an advanced walkthrough walk video where I'm explaining the house at a high level? Um, how are we doing that? How far can I take them down where it starts to make it that regardless of where they find me, but I can walk them down that, that funnel? So that's one of the big things that I, I, I think is going to stick on the marketing side. And again, uh, that's the first piece. The second piece I'm thinking of is lead conversion. I believe that leads can be converted at a much higher level if they see your face, if they hear your voice. And guess what? You can text video. You can text video out. I don't, and this is one of those areas where I feel people are really, you know, just not, not addressing this aggressively enough, where you can really go in and create a whole um, conversation drip plan based on a video 
and, and build rapport with people because then if they see you and hear you, then they can actually start to trust you, like you, all that kind of stuff. So when I, when they do actually talk to you or meet you or do a zoom call with you, they know who you are already. It's not, it's not that additional level of, of, of friction that we have to overcome. So uh, thinking through lead conversion, it can be your presentations too. I know I've talked about presentations before on um, the past couple of digital Wednesdays, it's a huge leverage piece for us, recording our presentations, recording all of your um, buyer and listing consultation pieces, or maybe you're taking videos and producing that as marketing content, and then you work that into your drip plans for your funnels where it's teaching people how to stage their homes, and it's good, valuable content that they like. That's a huge piece of lead conversion. Um, intro, intro vids of yourself, having short little clips of yourself talking about your business, your experience, your unique selling proposition, what sets you apart. Um, and then it's creating all those funnels. I think lead conversion is an area where video will not only stick, it's going to outpace everybody. The people who embrace lead conversion videos are going to see something completely different than people who do not embrace lead conversion videos. And I think you're going to see that big separation happen towards the end of this year going into 2021. Um, and then I thought, okay, external, now internal, what else can we do with video that will really help the process along? And one of the key things that we're doing is our prospect to close, so the time someone becomes a prospect, all the way to closing the guidance videos that we're doing. And this is something that I get excited about and I think it's pretty cool, but it takes them through every step of the process. And we talked about it last week with our home buying guide. We just, we're just digitizing that is all we're doing. And then we're walking them through it on a camera with them seeing us. So it's almost like they're on a little mini seminar and we're just walking them through that. And what it does is we, we teach them about that part of the process. And then we say, this is what's next. And the feedback we're getting is that they really appreciate it because most people will consume a video now more than they will consume um, anything you write up, your 83 page, you know, buyer manual, whatever it is, they're more likely to consume a three minute video saying, here's what, what we're doing in this part of the process. Here's what happens next. Here's what we're doing in this part of the process. Here's what happened next. Um, they consume that at a much higher level. So we're internally, we're saying our prospect all the way to closing guidance is huge. And then the drip campaigns after that, the nurturing of our, of our database where we're doing videos that we get so many comments. Now it's, it's almost funny where people are asking us, uh, uh, asking us one to do other videos on topics they're curious about, but also that we'll see them at our client events or we'll be on a call with them and say, oh yeah, well, and we actually had this happen. And he said, yeah, well, I saw a video y'all did on how important permits are and I was getting a deck put on, so I had to go get a permit done. So it just validates that people are watching the content and they want to hear from you, they want to see you. Um, so it's, it's a really good nurturing tool as well. And then the last piece for internal is your training. If you're ever going to build a team, if you're ever, even if you just add one other person to your world, where it's an admin, maybe they're going to be a virtual assistant, um, whatever it is, just just digitizing all your training with video, man. Just, just go through and do screen records of what you're doing. It's so much easier for me to now that I don't have to go back and say something 12 times to somebody. It's here's the video. Go watch it. You can literally see what I'm doing without me having to type out a 30-page document that you're most likely not going to read anyway. So creating an internal training manual has been a big, big piece for us when it comes to video going forward. And I think that's not going to go away. And I'll say this as well. The people who have the if you are building a team or ever intend to build a team, the people who create video training libraries for their team, they allow you to go faster than everyone else because people will come in and be able to watch videos and they'll be able to see exactly the processes that you do. They'll see your tonality. They'll see your facial expression. They're going to pick up on all the intangibles that you cannot teach them. And even if you teach them one time, they're going to forget some of it, have to come back and watch it. Um, that's why doing it in person is more of a time suck now. So going back to the other thought process for us was, leverage. It's a leverage piece. Video is a huge leverage piece within your business. Um, so those are the four key areas I, I see going forward as something that's going to stick. And, and I think that there's so much opportunity there for agents who are building businesses or, or if you're an independent agent, marketing, those four key areas that I think will, will really make the difference in accelerating your business in the second half of this year, but also going in just forward indefinitely. Love it, love it, love it. So, uh, Ben, I have an observation and then I have a question. Uh, so uh, an observation for everyone to consider is uh, sometimes when we start thinking about this type of thing, 
we look around at, at our competition and we see that very few, if any of our competition are doing this. And I think we'd all agree that that probably gives us a little bit of a false sense of security. So what I'd like for you to consider doing is look at the consumer experience outside of real estate. Look at how, um, and I'll just give some big names as a starting point. You can work backward off of that. Look at how Starbucks or Disney or whoever, Apple, how they deliver consumer experience because the general public's out there living in that world every day. And they're gonna compare us to what they see from those other companies that they do a lot of business with. Debbie and I spend a lot of time talking about this as we think about the future of what we're constantly iterating and building internally for us is, is are we comparing ourselves to our peers or are we comparing ourselves to the best that it's being done at the consumer experience level? So, so take that thought, take the things that you just went through, Ben, and let's imagine that I'm watching this video and I'm like, all right, I, I hear you, man. I hear you. Uh, where do I start? <laughs> do I need, <laughs> how do I make sense of all of this? Like I went from feeling like I'm doing all right to now I'm like out there in the street somewhere wondering what the hell is going on. So uh, how do I start chipping away at some of this stuff? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. And I, I think it definitely goes back to, if we're just speaking about video, then then where you would start, I, I would suggest starting is creating things around the, the content or tools you already have. So for me, it goes back to when we started down video, the first area you would start with is is thinking from a store concept, what's the product that you have to sell? Right. What's the product that you have to sell? It's it's listings. That's what people want to engage with you for at first is, is the listing content that you're providing, um, providing information around the the product you already have. So whatever listings you have, I would say start there, create those walkthrough tours there, create if you don't have a video done there, do do that first. Uh, that'll be the easiest uh, way into it because then it also takes the onus off of you being the star performer, right? I think sometimes we're we're also so stuck on uh, getting in front of a camera and thinking we have to wow and bedazzle the crowd that sometimes if you have another person or another thing there, uh, such as a listing of yours, that it can really take the focus off of you because people, and this, this is going to hurt a lot of feelings here because real estate agents are so egotistical. I'm, I'm one of them, King. The, the, the thought process here is that they're there to watch you when in reality, they're there to see the house. So if you do want to start in this, you want to ease your way into a kind of that toe in the water, go do a walkthrough video of your house and just do a simple intro. Don't even talk through the video, just walk through the house and show the house off. And then just have someone hold it, hold the camera and just you talk about a little bit about the front and front from the house, nothing major there. Um, and then what people are there to see is the house. So start with the products you have. Uh, the other, the other way I would ease into it is uh, so, so we mentioned at the top about content curation versus creation. So this is going to get into that a little bit. The thought process behind all of this that I'm a big fan of is, is the curation curation aspect meaning um, or creating a, a pillar content. So your listings, again, act as your pillar content. They, they can be done or used for a lot of different things. And I'm a big fan. And if you do the digital marketing course that we have for you guys to sign up for, it's, it's one of those things where you can go in and we go into this in, in detail in there is going in and taking one item and breaking it down and using it multiple times. I think people freeze up. Right. When they hear, oh, I have to do four levels of video marketing. I have to create all of this stuff and it's all on me to be creative and I'm not a creative person. So they have all these 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 expectations in their head built up of what they have to do. And really, it just goes back to take one big thing, make a video on it and then let's break it down into different areas. So let's do. Um, a listing video. And then in that listing video, when you're there, maybe we highlight some of the staging that's been done on the house. Maybe the, the sellers listen to you about painting the home or doing some upgrades in the home. And you can highlight that in your video about three tips on how to stage the home. So that's, that's another piece of that listing. Again, we're just using that big listing to go ahead and break it into further components. Um, another way to do this is just creating a weekly show where you are talking or maybe you're interviewing someone and then you take pieces of that show and you filter it out. Um, it's one of the key areas where you'll get a lot of engagement where people don't have to watch a full 10 minute show if they just get a, a 60 second clip 
of, you know, here's one of the key tips on how to stage your home uh, or something that you don't want to do if you're putting your home on the market. So start there with the, with the products you do have and then break that pillar content down. So that's how you can create versus having to really uh, uh, worry about um, taking or creating something out of nothing. Start with the listings, go from there. Um, so did you want to get into content curation and creation? Did we go there at this point? Yeah, let's talk about curation here in just a second. Before we do that, I'll put you on the spot with a, a question here. So if you have an answer for it, great. And if you don't, that's okay too. Uh, let's say I'm watching this and I'm saying, all right, Ben, I'm all in on the video thing and I'm concerned about uh, my presentation style or I'm concerned about the, the technicals of producing a really good video. Uh, what would be just a few sort of popcorn, some ideas here, resources that you would point people to uh, so that they could either see what you're looking for. And this could be non-real estate specific. It could just be like, here's an example of a well-produced video, or here's an example of some things to go study on, on presentation style. And I've got a few ideas as well. You're just more, more in that component than I am. Yeah. So, I, I mean, there's, there's definitely places you can go and look up other agents, see what they're doing. That's the first place I would go. So there's a couple people that I follow um, who, who do it and, and we're not at their level yet either. So I'll say that too. There, there are people that I aspire to be that I really like their content. So let me hit the, the presentation style or the technical aspects right now. Don't get too caught up in it. You'll, you, you see this about, I think about every week, I'll pick my phone up and said, this is the main tool you need to do business right now. Just shoot a video on it and your presentation will get better as you go along. Uh, it's not, it's one of those things where some people don't like how they sound or how they talk and that comes with practice. So go get some reps in. Um, it, it, it's it's kind of like going to the gym, right? You have to do the push ups to get the muscle that takes time. So, so do that on the front end. Just don't be afraid to go out and execute on these things. Technically, there's a book uh, called How to Shoot Video That Doesn't Suck, and it's like an MBA course packed into like, I think it's 168 pages or something, it gives you everything you need to know on angles, on lighting, on uh, professional equipment, all the way down how to like do it on an amateur level uh, and how to not make it super expensive. So that's probably the first resource I would say go look up. Um, and then the beautiful thing about all this is as you're doing it, you can, you, I mean, YouTube's a fantastic resource, guys, for figuring out how to set lighting up, how to get the right cameras, how to fix audio. Um, I, I will say the, the, the one thing, if you're going to spend money on, well, there's two things I'll say spend money on. Get lighting. So softbox lighting for yourself is really important or just a simple ring light. They're like 30 bucks. And the other thing is uh, get good audio. So if you're recording on your phone, you can buy a lab mic that plugs right into your phone. It'll increase the quality of your sound a thousand percent. And trust me, people will watch a sketchy, crappy looking video. They will run from really bad sound. Uh, it's just been proven over and over and over again. So be willing to spend a little bit of money there on your sound. And that makes all the difference in the long run. Awesome. Awesome. Great work. Um, okay. So let's change gears then and talk about curation and the difference in curation and creation and uh, why they might consider doing something like that. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, curation versus creation. So this is one of my big things. And again, I'm a Gary Vaynerchuk fan, as you guys know. So he's always talking, one of the lines he's always telling people is, is when they talk about creating things, he says, document, don't create. You can jot that in your notes. Document, don't create. And that just means that instead of trying to sit there and think about what am I going to make today, you just kind of document your daily routine, document the work you're doing. I'll tell you this, authenticity, again, something I've been beating the drum on, and you're, I'm going to continue doing it, so get used to that, is, is really big right now. People love behind-the-scenes videos. People love behind-the-scenes of what does your daily job actually look like? What do you actually go and do as a real estate agent, um, you know, where, when you're, when you're staging a house, things of that nature. So uh, documenting uh, and creating go hand in hand for us, where we're now looking at ways of during the day, can we have people shoot videos? If you're a single agent or on team, can you shoot videos and use that to kind of show the culture of your team or the culture of you or your personality or what you do differently? Maybe you do something differently at a listing. It's a great thing to document while you're doing it. Um, and it, and the, the, the side note on that is you're already doing that work, so might as well document it and then use it as part of your marketing efforts down the road. Um, curation is one of my favorite things in the world, and we do this a lot. Uh, and, and again, most of the stuff that we do, I don't claim any original thought in this. This is all things I've seen work, either in other verticals, and then we brought it back into real estate. So if you don't follow uh, this newsletter, it's called Morning Brew. 
They're one of the best content cre- uh, curators in the world. They really don't write a ton of original content. They, 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 they have good copywriting skills. Most of their content is just from, from news articles that they've picked up, um, from different things that they read that they found interesting or they found that people may find interesting. Uh, and, and basically, they're, they're a business newsletter that goes out every day um, in email format. And they took a, a, a medium that people said were dead or had no life going forward, which was email. And they've got I think they just hit two million subscribers on it. So it's a really uh, interesting way in how to curate content. And the way we do that is, is, and this is the simplest way to do it, is just go on Google again, type in real estate news, see what pops up. So for example, if you, if you were to type in real estate news, you probably would see something about the forbearances, right? People right now are all talking about forbearance in real estate. What does that do? What does that impact? Oh, well, you probably have an opinion on that. So go pull an article up, read through the article. Do you agree with it or not? you can say your opinion about it to your people, right? That, that's a really easy way to just curate information, almost as if you're having a conversation, do a video on it, do an article on it, um, whatever you want to do there. Um, the other thing that within the curation aspect of things is what we call news jacking. That's where you go and find a hot topic of the day, whatever it is, and you can do a hot take on it and just say, this is what I'm thinking about this. This is what my knowledge is and bring it. And the way we like to do this is go, if you go national, bring it back to local. So if there is a story on national home prices, for example, bring it back local. So your people who are in your sphere that are going to be seeing this or in your area that are going to be seeing this can make that differentiation. Again, trying to get them to associate you as the local expert. So you can always go out and news jack, take a big item, a big item of the day, bring it back down. The side note on this, not getting too in the weeds on it, is that the algorithms love it. So if you see something that's trending, seize on to whatever's trending and then use that inside of your marketing play for yourself. Um, So that's curation at a high level. Um, your, your weekly newsletters, again, we send one out on a weekly basis. Most of our stuff is just curated out. So we'll put opinion around it. We'll write a quick article around it. It typically takes less than an hour to do at this point, and people find a lot of value in it. Um, and then the creation side of things, I would say document. Don't create. Document your day. Authenticity kills it right now. Yep. Yep. Uh, beautiful part about the documentation, too, is you're already doing it. And even if it's if you're documenting in written word or in video or sharing an opinion about it, it's already there. So there's not a ton of friction in the in the creation piece of that. So I uh, love what you're saying there. Uh, well, we got a few minutes. So uh, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, what you guys are doing with VIP groups? Because uh, I know that's a topic that's starting to become more prevalent right now. Uh, not necessarily connected to what we've talked about so far. However, a little bonus content before we wrap up. Yeah. Uh, VIP groups. This is this is an interesting concept that we're testing. And we're, we've been digging into this for the past several weeks. And we've had we have VIP Facebook groups. We have different groups created for our clients. And the thought process was that uh, it was easier for us to connect in there if they didn't see an email. Again, one of my key concepts that I really believe in is we have to communicate with people on the medium that they're on, right? Whether they're on text, email, social, if it's a video that they prefer, if it's a written word, we it's our job to communicate to them how they want to be communicated with. So we started building out Facebook groups a while ago, and, and they've got a lot of traction now. Um, so what we've noticed is that the more content we put in there, the more likely those things are to be featured on that person's newsfeed if they're a part of our, uh, our Facebook groups. And one of the thought processes that we have was how do we create a VIP program for our clients? How, how do we go about, you know, instilling that, especially right now, how would that be beneficial? Um, and, and the thought process behind it was imagine belonging to a club, right? So for ease of you, say Costco, Sam's Club, something along those lines, but they have membership tiers that you have to buy just to get in to the club. There's perks of it, of getting in that you can save money, get better prices on stuff, um, all, all that good stuff. So part of that thought process was, well, how can we create that in the real estate world to build some type of loyalty amongst our clients, you know, amongst our people? And really, it's a good way for us to say thank you to them for being part of this. And, and so we started instilling this, really looking at our A plus and our A clients. So um, those are our top tier people, our A plus people. It's a very small group in in in, in terms of the, the the relation to the total size of our database. And we were thinking about how can we really do something for them 
And then I thought, well, what if we did something for them on a monthly basis that no one else had access to, and we would let everybody else know about it, they just wouldn't get access to that. What would that look like? So we're, we're putting together a membership program with rewards and everything and different tiers to it based on um, referrals to the business, based on different things of that nature. Um, and then also access to different types of content too. So our people are actually starting to request content from us around certain topics. Um, they're requesting masterminds from us around certain topics. So we're building out business networking groups within our database, which is a strange thing to think about. And we have a lot of small business owners that we work with that are, are wanting to, to connect with each other and we can facilitate that discussion. And as that grows, it puts us at the center of it. So. The VIP program is really um, how can we connect people inside of our database and then how can we create the desire to be part of the membership tiers going forward. That's something we're working on right now and we're putting it all together um, over the next several weeks. And, and as that becomes uh, uh, more built out, we'll share more on it going forward. I think it's going to be something good, though, in terms of retention of clients, but also when we're when we're working through um, uh, bringing people not just outside because then what it'll do is start growing, right? So that's the thought process behind this is people will hear about it, then they want to become a part of it. How do they get they, they get entrance to it? Um, and and long term, it'll eventually be a, kind of the gateway for us to uh, bring new business in while facilitating old business as well. So uh, that's something we'll be doing over the next several weeks. We'll keep you guys in 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 tune as we uh, as we build it out the rest of the way. What's so cool about what you're doing there is that you're you're pinging on something that I just read an article about earlier this week, and I'm I'm going to misquote the phrase. So pardon me if there are any social scientists in the group. Uh, the the main thing was the difference in in uh, like benign comparison and malignant comparison. And so there's an element of I'm comparing what I'm getting to someone else. And it's benign if I don't if I don't hate on the person for it. I'm aspirational toward that. I want to be in that group. And then the opposite of that can be true if overplayed, like a great example of where it can, can sometimes be overplayed is the first class cabin of a plane versus the one row behind the first class cabin of a plane. Uh, and that that's borderline malignant. So you're playing on a really cool thing there. It's that aspirational wanting to be in that group, say. Uh, very yeah. Good. All right. Great. So, yeah. uh, so I'm sorry. Go ahead. You had a final thought? No, yeah, final thought on that. The, 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 the thing that spurned that thought for us was when we had a client actually say to us, how do we get access to your top tier client events that we were throwing? They said, and then they actually told one of their, we heard another person in their family saying, oh, my, the, it was his mother. He said, my mother told me I actually had to do this. Otherwise, I wouldn't get invited to any of your VIP client events. So that's where it spurned the thought of how do we create a membership program around that? So I think you're right. The aspirational side of it is what we're going for. Sure. Absolutely. And clearly you guys are nailing it with that. Uh, so lots of great ideas today. Uh, a couple of things as you're as we're all wrapping up here together, what I'd love for you guys to do who are watching the video right now, Ben gave you a ton of exciting and cutting edge stuff today. I'd like for you just in the comments, if you will, real quick note, one thing that you took away from this and or one thing that you're going to take action on, drop it in the comments so that Ben and I know that the work that he's doing is having a lot of impact, which we know it is because we hear that from you guys. So drop it in the comments, top takeaway or top action item. I'm also gonna drop in the comments for you uh, access to a course that Debbie and I just released. It is a, a six module session on working with buyers and advanced skills around that. Uh, we built this thing from scratch. We spent three months working on it, downloadable workbooks, script books, buyer consultation, sample packets, whole nine yards. I won't do the sales pitch here. You can go to the landing page to check it out. Uh, it's great stuff. We're very proud of it. And uh, we'd love for you to go test drive that as well. Uh, ben, great job as always, my friend. We'll catch you next time. See you guys. All right. Sounds good. See you guys.